Elva Eugenie Stewart was a 34-year-old who lived with her father in Gawler, a country town just north of Adelaide, South Australia, in 1950. Her mother Annie had passed away in 1946, at the age of 60. Elva worked cleaning passenger railway carriages. In January 1950, she went on a date with a man she had met on the train from Gawler to Adelaide. It was destined to end tragically. William Henry Rogers was a labourer who lived in the suburb of Renown Park. He was Irish-born and had emigrated to Australia in 1937. He was a small man and blind in his left eye. Now 41, he had married in 1938 and had one daughter who was eight years old in 1950. He and his wife had split up six years earlier. She and their child lived in Western Australia. Rogers had been in South Australia for 16 months. He had seen Elva in Hindley Street in Adelaide five or six weeks earlier, and she must have made an impression for him to remember her when they met by chance in the train between 8.30 and 9pm on January the 21st, a Saturday night. She had a small bag with her containing some bottles of beer. Rogers was on his way to a dance hall, but he later claimed that Elva had invited him to come and have a drink with her down on the banks of the Torrens River. Adelaide Railway Station is situated beside the river. He had a bottle of wine with him. The pair walked along the river's edge until they came to Jolly's Boat House, adjacent to King William Road. Here they paused and shared the first bottle of beer between themselves. Rogers later told police that he believed Elva had been drinking before he met her, as he could smell alcohol on her breath, although she did not behave as though she was drunk. It was here that they had intercourse. Having finished the bottle, they decided to hire a rowboat from Jolly's. It was about 9.45pm. From the boathouse they rowed slowly upriver towards the University of Adelaide. There is a footbridge here spanning the river, and it was near here that their impromptu date turned catastrophic. They drank the second bottle of beer, but having finished it, something happened to upset the boat when it was near the bank. Rogers claimed it was Elva's fault, while the police alleged it was due to Rogers making advances to Elva. But whatever the cause, the young woman ended up falling into the dark water. Rogers said he dived in to rescue her. He later said that in doing so he lost his wallet containing some money, a gold tie pin, a fountain pen and his wristwatch. It is possible that he too simply fell in the water as well. Once out of the water they hung up their clothes to dry on the trees. Rogers made a suggestion while they were semi-clad. However, it seemed to annoy Elva and she refused hitting him on the forehead with one of her shoes. He grabbed her shoe and threw it in the flower pot. He slapped her across the face twice in retaliation, and also hit her in the chest with an open hand. Considering the amount of time which then passed, little about it was spoken of by either person. They would have arrived near the bridge sometime around 10pm. They stayed there until around 4am in the morning. At the corner of King William Street and North Terrace, the couple, both slathered with mud, approached a taxi and asked the driver, Malcolm White, to take Elva home to Gawler. The driver said it was too far and that he needed a permit to drive his taxi there and declined the fare. Rogers then suggested that Elva accompany him in the cab to Ovingham and wait for a train to Gawler there, but she declined. Instead, Rogers borrowed six shillings from Elva and was driven to Ovingham just outside the city. White saw Elva walking off towards the railway station on North Terrace at about 4.45am as he drove away. During the journey, Rogers remarked that he and Elva had been boating and fallen in the river. White observed that Rogers' clothes had dried out, but had been wet. Rogers told the driver that he had spent some time waiting for the girl to come to, suggesting he may have knocked Elva unconscious. Between 5am and 6am, Elva slept in a railway carriage before deciding to go and look for assistance. At 6.30 on Sunday morning, Mrs Dorothy Piper, another carriage cleaner who worked with Elva, was awakened at her home in Crowther Street, Adelaide, by Elva knocking on her door. When Dorothy saw Elva, she was still damp, covered in dirt, the right side of her face was swollen, there was a bruise on her neck and there was dried blood on her face. Elva was upset and depressed. Dorothy helped the stricken woman to have a bath to clean herself up and then put her to bed and waited for the police who had been summoned. A plainclothes constable arrived at 9am 
and discovering that Elva was only semi-conscious, arranged for an ambulance. While being interviewed by Constable O'Malley, Elva vomited, and rather dramatically said, I'll never see the day out. This is the end of me. Elva was taken to Royal Adelaide Hospital, just several hundred metres from the river bank where she had been hurt. When asked what had happened, she told the police, I'll never get over this. He gave me a terrible beating. I'll never see the day out. She was asked, why did he knock you about like this? She answered, he tried to do rude things to me. I tried to stop him. She added that she was unable to prevent him, as he punched and punched her. Elva's father, Edgar Stewart, arrived to visit his daughter, and she told him that somebody had bashed her. A gardener named Alan Crosby was watering seedlings at 6.15am on the morning of the 22nd of January, when he observed Rogers looking for something in the Dahlia plot. Rogers informed the other man he was searching for his lost tie pin and fountain pen. Crosby noticed the state of the flower bed, and later said it appeared as if a very rough wrestling match had taken place in it. He said the damage was not done by trampling, but by somebody rolling around on the plants. The gardener also noticed an article of woman's underwear and a sandal nearby, as well as two patches of blood on the grass. Rogers got into a boat and rowed away towards City Bridge when Crosby last saw him. Ernest Jolly, the boatman, recovered the boat the couple had hired the night before from near the footbridge early Sunday morning. He didn't think it showed any signs of having been tipped over. Later, at about 8.30am, he also saw Rogers, this time near the boathouse. Again, Rogers said he was trying to find his fountain pen. He also asked for his four shillings deposit on the boat to be returned to him. Police examined the Dahlia plot and found the clothing which they discovered was bloodstained, as well as one of Elvis' shoes. Early on Monday morning, at 4.15am on the 23rd of January, Dr. Lyndon was called in to check on Elva. He found her unconscious and close to death. An operation was immediately carried out on her brain to relieve pressure from bleeding. A blood clot was removed, but the operation proved unsuccessful. And just ten minutes later, at 7am, Elva Eugenie Stewart died of a subdural haemorrhage. At 10.30 the same morning, Rogers was arrested at his workplace and taken for questioning about the incident. He said he had been with some Sheila. He didn't know her name. When told that Elva had died, he reacted by saying, No, you're fooling. It couldn't be true. Rogers denied that he had raped, or tried to rape, Elva, although they did have consensual sexual activity. He said she had been teasing him, and when she hit him with her shoe, he got nasty. Sergeant Gully said that it appeared a struggle had taken place in the Dahlias. Rogers replied that the flowers had been damaged by Elva looking for her shoes. Then Rogers said, She teased me so much, I don't really know what happened. I didn't mean to kill her, I couldn't do that. She was alright after it was over. We walked to the city bridge. At his trial in March, the prosecution contended that if Elva had died as a result of violence committed against her by Rogers as he attempted to rape her, then even if there was no intention of killing, it was still murder. If there was no attempt at rape, then it would be manslaughter. Rogers admitted hitting Elva, but denied he had raped her. Dr Simpson, who had examined Elva as she lay dying, said that her injury could have been caused falling out of the boat. Dr Linden concurred that the haemorrhage was caused by injury, but not necessarily by violence. The type of clot which formed in her brain was known to be caused by even a comparatively light blow. The cause of the clot could have occurred up to two weeks earlier, he said. There was no exterior bruising or other damage at the site of the clot. John Bard, a railway porter, revealed that Stewart had tripped and fallen at Largs Bay two or three weeks earlier, in late December 1949, giving herself a black eye. Dr Dwyer, who conducted the post-mortem examination of Elva, reported that there were numerous bruises, abrasions and other small injuries on her body which were consistent with a sexual assault. Asked about the injury two or three weeks earlier, Dwyer said it could have predisposed the clot forming on January 22nd. On the 17th of March 1950, the jury retired for an hour to consider their verdict. They asked for directions from the judge. If they arrived at a guilty verdict, 
could they add a rider for a strong recommendation for mercy? Told they could do so, they retired again for five minutes and returned with the guilty verdict. Justice Mayo then pronounced sentence of death. While Rogers was at Adelaide Jail waiting on an appeal for clemency, on the 23rd of March, Alfred Coates Griffin was hanged for the murder of Elsie May Wheeler. The appeal was based on the question of the statements made by Elva while in hospital. They had been treated as dying declarations, but it was argued that they did not qualify as such. Dying depositions are statements made by people who know for certain they have little time left to live, and were considered to be truthful, because a person on the verge of death would not lie so near to passing on to some judgment in the other world, depending on which religious belief they adhered to. Secondly, it was argued the verdict went against the weight of the evidence. Elva's blood clot could have originated with the fall she took in December. What really happened that night on the banks of the Torrens River will never be known for sure. Little of Elva's life and character was revealed. John Bard, the railway porter, who saw the pair on the night walking through the concourse, said that Elva was somewhat mentally backward, and her nickname at work was Mountain Music. He also remarked that she dressed in a mannish style. She lived alone with her father, who was 67 at the time she died. It could be assumed that Elva, going willingly with a man she barely knew, to drink alcohol in the semi-darkness, meant she should have been aware that something of a sexual nature could occur. But if she was slow mentally, as the porter suggested, then maybe not. Perhaps she was lonely and expected nothing of the kind. She said she was raped. Rogers denied it, but did say he had sex with her, and accused her of teasing him when she would not do so again. In the end, this uncertainty of exactly what occurred spared Rogers from the hangman's rope. On the 3rd of April, his conviction was altered from one of murder to one of manslaughter. On the 1st of May, Rogers learnt his new penalty. He was sentenced to seven years' imprisonment. Nothing of Rogers' background in Western Australia was mentioned publicly at the time. It would appear that he was the man of that name, with a string of offences in the wildflower state. Rogers' first run-in with the law occurred in October 1940, when living in Boulder, he accosted a woman in Hannon Street, Kalgoorlie. He followed her into a doorway, made lewd suggestions, and then exposed himself to her. He then broke off his assault and went to a hotel. The woman phoned for police and Rogers was arrested, but fled up Hannon Street before the constable could recapture him. On the 2nd of November 1940, he said he was so intoxicated he didn't know what he was doing, and that his actions should be looked upon as a human lapse, and that someone else in a similar case was merely fined for their actions. Rogers was sentenced to four months hard labour. In 1942 he was caught driving drunk and unlicensed, for which he was fined £20. 1945 saw him employed by the Fremantle Harbour Trust and arrested for theft, for stealing six towels, an electric light switch, a pair of overalls, and five tins of dried onions, he received a jail sentence of three months. Celebrating too hard at Christmas 1946 caused more trouble. Then working as a grave digger and living in Gloucester Street's Shenton Park, at 11.20am, while drunk, he approached a woman walking down Hay Street, Perth. Flourishing the bottle of beer he had in his hand, he invited the woman to have a drink, which she refused. She continued to walk on, but Rogers followed, calling out, shouting and using obscene language. The woman boarded a tram and warned him to go away, or she would call a constable. But while waiting to leave, Rogers walked alongside the tram, still calling out profanities. It was his bad luck that the woman was an off-duty police officer. In court, Rogers was told he had to restrain himself so that streets would be safe for women to walk down. I don't remember a thing, he pleaded. I was drunk at the time. Magistrate Warwork told him, Well, you'll have plenty of time to think it over, as he sentenced him to one month's imprisonment on the 27th of December, 1946. Rogers didn't think it over enough, apparently, for on the 27th of May, 1948, he was again sentenced by Magistrate Warwick. In light of what happened a year and a half later, the event was ominous. Mrs Dorothy Alice Cousins was assaulted at Shenton Park on the 22nd of May. She had spoken to Rogers, whom she did not know, in a hotel in Perth. Later they went to a hotel in Shenton Park, where they stayed until closing time, 
whereupon they went to a nearby park. Rogers asked Dorothy if she wanted to meet his mother and little girl. Saying she would, he asked her to go up a dark lane with him, but she refused. Rogers punched Dorothy, knocking her down and fracturing two ribs and badly bruising her face and body. Her screams brought a man to check on the commotion, and Rogers left. The blame was not entirely Rogers, according to Magistrate Warwork. Dorothy had been in the courts in January of 1948, where she was described as often drunk, violent and abusive towards her husband. A boarder, who lived with the cousins, said she got drunk on wine three times a week, and then took to beer bottles and carving knives. The magistrate then forecast the future when he said, But not infrequently in the past this kind of conduct has led to killing. This woman was apparently badly knocked around, and this must be stopped. Rogers was sent to jail for two months, less than the sentence he received for stealing the dried onions and other goods in 1945. Rogers was back in Hannon Street, Kalgoorlie, in November 1948, where he was fined ten pounds for obstructing traffic while betting with others, shortly before he moved to South Australia, and that fateful night on the banks of the Torrens in 1950.